So good morning, Andreas. Uh, good afternoon to the people in the room or in Zoom. And I welcome you to our guest lecture in this semester given by Andreas Marikopoulos. I would like to introduce you with uh, very few sentences. So I try to summarize uh, your bio. So Andreas is a professor at the University of Delaware and the director of the Socio Sociotechnical Systems Center. After receiving his diploma in Greece, he moved to the US and did his master's and PhD uh, at the University of Michigan. And his research interests, uh, I picked up the two related to the course today, uh, are cyber physical systems and learning in complex systems. So Dr. Dr. Marikopoulos is the recipient of several prizes and awards. And what is interesting for us is the uh, IEEE Intelligent Transportation Systems Young Researcher Award. And he is also uh, associate editor of several journals uh, of IEEE, uh, the well-known Automatica or uh, the transactions on intelligent vehicles. So Andreas, we are very excited to uh, listen to your lecture. So uh, now we can change the screen to your slides. Um, yeah, we are very happy. Great. Thank you so much, Basam. Thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, I'm glad that I'm visiting even virtually, uh, uh, you know, Aachen University. Um, and I hope at some point in the near future to be able to visit in person. I, I'm not sure if I have shared, I, I, I grew up, I, I attended a, a Greek German school uh, back in Greece. So I learned uh, a German, although I forgot about this, uh, you know, since I have never practiced. So I learned German and I, 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 I attended several classes in German. So Germany is always in my heart, although I have never been able to visit Germany. So we need to fix that and, and attend sometime and, and, and visit you all guys. So um, again, thank you for the invitation. What I plan to do today is to discuss how we can separate uh, the control from the learning tasks in cyber physical systems so that we can able to to combine both learning and control approaches and address some of the challenges. Um, the world is changing, and one particular sector that undergoes significant transformation is, is transportation. Uh, we're about to depart from conventional vehicles with internal combustion engines and move on to electric vehicles. And, and this transformation will create new opportunities and challenges. For example, we need to upgrade our in existing infrastructure of the transportation network with uh, charging stations. We need to develop control technologies that can coordinate the increasing demand of electricity from vehicles and, 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 and optimize this demand. Uh, we need also to uh, uh, you know, have opportunities to integrate uh, electric vehicles with commercial and uh, residential buildings and eventually create off-grid buildings. And, and in addition to all this, uh, we can have also opportunities to use the shared information and data from vehicles and use this uh, data to control vehicles and coordinate vehicles in a way to improve transportation efficiency. Uh, so the common theme of all these applications is that we have a cyber component, which is data or shared information, and we use the cyber component to control the physical entities. So essentially we have cyber physical uh, systems. Now, somebody might ask why we should be focusing so much on transportation. Well, in 2017, the United States consumed on average 19.96 million barrels of petroleum and 71% of that usage was to uh, power uh, transportation, was about transportation. That's enough fuel to, to fill up the uh, entire, um, you know, Empire State Building over two times just to propel the vehicles in the United States only. So you can see the, the contribution and the impact of transportation in oil displacement and also to the environment. With the introduction of connected automated vehicles, which are si uh, typical cyber physical systems, we, are, uh, we have great opportunities to uh, improve transportation efficiency, uh, reduce oil displacement, uh, you know, have an impact of the environment and eventually have a positive impact on the health of the planet. So what I plan to do today is to go through several learning and bundle-based control approaches that I have worked over the years 
on emerging mobility systems. In particular, I'll, I'll go through some learning techniques that uh, I worked on to make the engines of the vehicles to learn their optimal operation with respect to the driver's driving style. Then I'll talk a little bit about hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in electric vehicles. And, 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 and also I'll show you some model-based control techniques that we developed to co coordinate connected automated vehicles and improve transportation efficiency. Now at the end, I hope I can make the case and by highlighting the challenges of learning and model-based control techniques to convince you that if we can separate this, then we will be able to combine uh, uh, you know, learning and control uh, techniques in, in cyber physical uh, systems. So before I get to, um, to the technical discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of my students in the IDS lab. Uh, in the IDS lab, we develop uh, the theories and algorithms that can make cyber physical systems uh, to realize their optimal operation while uh, they're interacting with the environment. Uh, the applications, the focus of our applications is transportation mainly, but we also work on socio-technical systems, social media platforms, and, and some other uh, recent uh, applications. To validate our control algorithms, we have uh, created a testbed, a, a scale city, robotic scale city, uh, which uh, covers 20 by 20 feet or six by six meters area. Uh, with this uh, city, we have about 50 robotic cars that we have built in house and 10 uh, uh, crazy flyer uh, drones. And we use this uh, test to, to, to test to go beyond simulation and validate the control algorithms to prove some concepts that we have uh, on, on magic mobility systems. For example, we use this testbed to uh, show how we can potentially have a coordination between a drone and a vehicle for first and last mile delivery options, like you see it here now in the video. Uh, so a drone can pick up a, a package from a building and coordinate with another vehicle to, to drop the package. We also use this testbed to show how we can have the drones act as a coordinators and coordinate the traffic at the intersections among the uh, connected automated vehicles and, and so forth and so on. Um, at the same time, we have uh, integrated a, a driver emulator in our robotic cars, so we can drive some of these cars and create an environment of mixed traffic conditions, like having connected automated vehicles and human-driven vehicles. Uh, so, as you can see, we, we have uh, you know, located some cameras ahead of the vehicle, so the students can drive the vehicles and then see what's going on through the monitor. And then they can have also, uh, you know, we can set up several scenarios between the human driven cars and the robotic cars and, and see what's going on. Um, we uh, also um, recently, um, you know, uh, created the digital city of our scale city. And there was, the reason was that, uh, you know, going to the city, we, we encountered different, several challenges to develop the control algorithm. So we thought that, we thought that if we have a, a, a digital platform, a simulation platform of our city to start with might be easier. And also we can use this uh, simulation plot, the digital city to share with our collaborators so that they can use and implement their control algorithms in a digital platform before they come to UD and do experiments in our scale city. Uh, more recently, we also developed an app for shared mobility in our scale city. So if you ever visit uh, UD, we can, uh, you can download this app and you can call any of our robotic cars to come and pick you up at some point in a, you know, of course, in a scale environment and give you a ride into uh, any other location inside the city. Uh, we don't charge anything at the moment, uh, so it's a free ride, but this is sort of an application that we can use just to sort of, uh, you know, uh, validate some of the eco-routing control algorithms that we're using. We also have a, a driver simulation test bed uh, with uh, six driver uh, simulators that we use commercial software like vSIM or CarSIM uh, and, and, and validate and do some simulation uh, studies. So with this uh, small introduction, let me uh, go back to the technical discussion. Uh, as I said, over the years, I have worked on different um, topics on uh, transportation. I started with my dissertation when I develop a, a learning control algorithm that can make the engines of the vehicles to learn to operate optimally with respect to the driver's driving style. Then I moved on to hybrid electric vehicles and plug in hybrid electric vehicles and develop power management uh, control algorithms that can maximize the efficiency of these vehicles. And over the last several years, I've been working on connected automated vehicles and how we can use shared information 
uh, and data uh, to control and coordinate these vehicles and, and improve transportation efficiency and safety, of course. So what I plan to do today is just to go through and tell you my story, starting from my dissertation all the way to today and, and, and go through different learning and model-based control techniques. I'll try to highlight the challenges that I have addressed over the years. And at the end, I will make the case how we can separate control with, uh, from learning. So the first chapter on my journey started in 2003 when I joined uh, the University of Michigan as a graduate student. I arrived in Michigan from uh, Greece and the, there were the, it was about 11 inches snow uh, at that time. So the first thing that I had to do is to buy long uh, woolen sacks to deal with the snow. And the second thing that I had to do is to uh, start to find a, a nice dissertation topic uh, to keep me busy for the next uh, five years or so. So I was going through different papers and reading articles. And then I realized that there is a common question across several people. They all wonder how we cannot achieve the miles per gallon posted on the window sticker. So I thought that this might be a, an interesting question to, to, to explore and, and try to find an answer. Um, when we buy a vehicle, right, it comes with a window sticker, at least here in the United States, the, the vehicles come with a, a, a window sticker from the Environmental Protector, uh, Protection Agency, and they show the uh, fuel economy for highway and fuel economy for a city. And although we can almost always achieve the highway fuel economy estimates, we can barely achieve those fuel economy estimates corresponding to the city driving. So let's see why is this the case. If we want to understand how engines operate, we need to look at the engine operating domain with respect to the brake specific fuel consumption, which are these contours. A brake specific fuel consumption, the BSFC map, gives you the fuel consumption per unit uh, power. And, uh, and, and the engine operating domain is the engine torque and engine speed. So the way that uh, the OEMs uh, optimize the uh, engines today, they take the engine operating domain and discretize it to a finite, usually small number of steady state operating points. A steady state operating point means that we operate the engine at constant torque and speed. And then they take uh, the several um, you know, uh, uh, controllable variables of the engine, like ejection timing, spark timing, variable geometry turbocharger, or uh, exhaust gas recirculation, and they find the optimal values of these controllable variables with respect to the, these steady state operating points. And then they come up with a big map and they put it in the electronic control unit of the engine. And as we drive the vehicle and we accelerate, as you can see here in the speed profile, the engines jump from operating point to operating point like this, and we interpolate the values of the controllable variables corresponding to the steady state operating points. And this is how we operate the engine sort of optimally. However, some of my colleagues at the University of Michigan who used to do experimental work made the following observation. If we operate the engine at this constant torque and speed, then fuel consumption is constant. However, if we operate, if we approach this engine operating point from a sequence of operating points, then the fuel consumption of the engine will vary for a small transient period. And moreover, if we approach this operating point from a different direction, then fuel consumption are associated with different values. So what happens when we drive the vehicle in a city, essentially we operate the engine under these transient periods, which means that the optimal values of the controllable variables corresponding to the steady state operating points cannot really capture the transient, uh, the optimal values corresponding to the transient uh, you know, uh, operation. However, to optimize the engine for all these transients a priori is infeasible, right? And the reason is that we have an infinite the infinite dimensional class of drivers. Every driver drives di different. So what I did in my dissertation, I thought that instead of focusing on steady state operating points, let me focus on the engine operating point transitions. So what I did, I modeled the engine operation as a control Markov chain, and then I develop a, a self-learning controller that can learn the transition probability matrix and transition cost matrix and then I formulated a stochastic optimal control problem that I could solve in real time. So as I was learning the transition probability matrix and transition cost matrix, I was developing an optimal uh, uh, look-ahead control policy that was able to give me the optimal values of the engine operating points or of the engine controllable variables corresponding to the engine operating point transitions. So with this, we did several studies with this approach. 
Uh, and we show that the more the driver drives the vehicle, the better fuel consumption becomes. And we can have at least an 8%, 8% improvement in the fuel uh, consumption. Um, recently, I heard from the University of Michigan that a tech di giant from uh, Silicon Valley uh, has approached the University of Michigan, then they have discussion to license this technology. So eventually they, they plan to, uh, you know, this, this uh, giant is a uh, you know, leader on autonomous vehicles. So apparently they plan to make autonomous vehicles with autonomous uh, uh, engines. Um, so this project um, attracted considerable attention at that time. And I end up uh, interviewing with several uh, OEMs in uh, Detroit, uh, GM, Ford, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Chrysler. And I end up working at General Motors uh, Research and Development. So when I joined GM, uh, they were working on a new combustion technology and they wanted to depart from the expensive uh, uh, fuel, uh, PSU electric fuel injectors and employ uh, the much uh, cheaper uh, solenoid fuel injectors. However, with a solenoid fuel injector, we have injector to injector variation on the, on the, on the fuel characteristic curve. So these are some uh, fuel injector characteristic curves for four different injectors at different cylinder pressure. And you can see how injector to injector, injector, to injector varies. So with this uh, new combustion technology, we're seeking to make multiple injections at low fuel masses. And it was pretty important to be able to have precise, uh, to know precisely the fuel injector characteristic care for of each injector. So the problem that I had to work on was how we can learn the fuel injector characteristic curve while we operate the engine. And you might think that this is a kind of a straightforward problem, right? You can you know, come up with any uh, you know, standard learning technique that you can learn this as a polynomial meta model or whatever. Now, the problem here with this problem was that I didn't have measurement of the fuel injected by the fuel injector. So although I can command the fuel injector, I cannot really know how much fuel has been injected inside the cylinder of the engine so that I can measure and take the measurement and come up with this. Uh, so I had to combine uh, data that I have from fuel injectors using supervised uh, learning techniques with some sort of uh, adaptive learning techniques. And I eventually came up with a way to learn the fuel injector characteristic curves with just fuel uh, injectors in a, in, a, in, in a few cycles. And that was quite important to, to be able to to calibrate the, uh, uh, the fuel injector characteristic you get with just fuel cycles. And we show that eventually we can improve um, fuel economy uh, by at least 4%, being able to learn the fuel injector characteristic curves while you operate the engine. Uh, one of the advantages of this approach was that you can also able to learn the day-to-day -day variation because we figure out that uh, every day, the fuel injector characteristic curves change uh, due to the environmental uh, conditions. And uh, so, th so that was uh, about 2010. And, and then we have the 2010 volcano eruption in Iceland. And perhaps you might wonder why is this related to what I'm talking about today? Well, believe it or not, this volcano changed my career path and also changed my uh, uh, research direction. The reason is that I was invited in 2010 to attend the German-American Frontiers uh, Symposium from the uh, uh, you know, National Academy of Engineering. And that was hosted at Oak Ridge in Tennessee. And they have invited several German, uh, German speakers from Germany to uh, attend and give a, a talk. But due to the uh, volcano uh, eruption, uh, all these uh, flights were canceled from Europe. So they were, the organizers uh, came by and said, hey, you know, they, they were looking for substitute talk, uh, speakers. So they asked me to give a substitute talk. Uh, one thing led to another, and there were several uh, people from Oak Ridge National Lab in the audience, and eventually, uh, you know, end up working at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, and working and, and changing direction and start working on uh, hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So when I joined uh, Oak Ridge National Lab from uh, General Motors, uh, the first project for me was to develop a, an optimal power management uh, control algorithm that can maximize the efficiency of hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So let's see what is a hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, in a hybrid electric vehicle, in addition to the engine, we have the motor, generator, and battery that can power the vehicle either in combination or separately. So as you, the driver demands power from the vehicle, this power demanded from the driver can be delivered either through the engine only, or through the motor only, or through the combination. 
as we use the motor, we deplete the battery. So at some point, the engine needs to, um, you know, also make sure that uh, use the generator to charge the battery. So this is uh, a lot of decision making process while the driver drives the vehicle so that to maximize the efficiency of the uh, powertrain, but at the same time maintain the battery uh, state of charge in a, in a desired level. So just to give you a flavor of this problem, uh, first of all, we identify the admissible state and control pairs of each of the subsystems, engine, motor, generator, and battery. And then the problem is to derive an optimal control strategy that will maximize the efficiency of the system or minimize uh, the cost of, uh, of the system. Uh, in this particular problem, uh, there are different cost criteria that you can use. In, 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 in my case, I use the long-term average cost per unit time. And the reason is that I wanted to make sure that I maximize the efficiency of the powertrain over the days, weeks, months that the uh, driver drives the vehicle. Now, to address this problem, there are two technical challenges. First, it's really hard to solve this problem on board the vehicle. Uh, in a vehicle, perhaps you know that on board the vehicle, you can barely solve a four by, uh, you know, find the inversion of a four by four matrix. We don't have the, com the cap computational capabilities on commercial vehicles. Uh, the um, second challenge is that even if you derive the optimal control strategy for a driver, this is not going to be optimal for another driver. So you need to be able to, have, to come up with an approach that can give you maximize the efficiency of the system uh, for any different driver. So what I did in this problem, I reformulated the problem as a multi-objective optimization problem where I wanted to maximize the, you know, the, 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 the efficiency of each of these subsystems. And then I solve this problem offline and, and find out the Pareto optimal solution for each different realization of the hybrid electric vehicle. So I solve, I had the model of the uh, hybrid electric vehicle for every different realization. I solve the offline, the uh, multi-objective optimization problem and find the optimal solution. And then I came up with a map and, and I put this map in the controller of the vehicle. And while the vehicle was operating, I was interpolating the optimal uh, Pareto solutions and eventually came up with a Pareto control strategy and mathematically I showed that this is also an optimal for the average cost criterion. Uh, we did several also simulation studies and we, we show that if you derive the uh, optimal control strategy with dynamic programming, we get the same solution with a Pareto optimal solution. To find out the solution with dynamic programming, we use Q-learning uh, since we have to use the background induction. So I use Q-learning and I was uh, running the simulation model over the same driving cycle again and again and again until I have a convergence. And once the uh, optimal control strategy converts, then I compare it with the control strategy of the Pareto optimal solution, and I show that this is, uh, you get the same results. Uh, as a matter of fact, we apply this control strategy, the Pareto optimal solution, into our demo vehicle, an Audi A3 plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. This is the Audi uh, e-tron. And we show that we can uh, have an improvement by at least 12% using the Pareto Optimal strategy. Our partner on this uh, project, Bosch, Robert Bosch, uh, thought that this is too good to be true. So they did some statistical analysis and they considered the engine operating points using the Audis controller and the engine operating points using the Pareto Optimal strategy. And they show that essentially we operate the engine under more stat statistically, more frequently, over the uh, BSFC maps that gives you better values. And that was the reason that we get all these uh, fuel economy uh, benefits. So when I developed this uh, power management control algorithm, I was still at the Oak Ridge National Lab. And by that time, I thought that there might be some opportunities using connectivity and automation to improve the efficiency even more or to improve the transportation efficiency. And what they have in mind is how we can essentially use connectivity and automation and coordinate the vehicles and avoid uh, congestion like this in, in specific scenarios like uh, you know, intersection, roundabouts, merging roadways, and so forth and so on. Now, if you think about it, these are not new ideas. The first time that something like automation was mentioned was in 1939 in New York's Futurama, where they have a big model for the future, for the work into the future, 20 years into the future. So one big sector of this uh, uh, exhibition was uh, devoted to transportation and they envisioned a, a, a fully highway automated system with all these vehicles going with a high speed. 
and uh, you know, improve safety. In 1956, GM uh, future the car into the future of, uh, you know, at, at, in 19, 1976, where essentially they future a car that was pure uh, self, you know, driving car. And they show, um, you know, uh, this car, uh, a family traveling to Chicago with this self-driving car, going to a dedicated lane for autonomous cars. Uh, you know, and, and then they uh, showcase different, uh, you know, luxury uh, aspects of, of these technologies. And they show the, 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 the car, the, the, the family, you know, enjoying, uh, you know, uh, the trip. Uh, the, gar, uh, the, the, the dad will uh, fire up a cigar in a, in a while. And then they will have ice cream and they will have, uh, you know, so that was the, you know, sort of the vision in 1956, how uh, <laughs> autonomous cars would look like in 1976. Now, the fact that over the last 83 years, <laughs> we're still uh, dreaming about of autonomous cars and we still have vision about how autonomous cars will uh, look like, speak to the fact that this is a very hard problem, right? And we still have a uh, way to go before we be able to realize some of these um, cars. Uh, this is a nice uh, feature. You, you see, this, this family make fun of this conventional car, which is human-driven car, right? They're in the dedicated car and they look at this human-driven car with uh, some sort of, uh, you know, attitude. So anyhow, uh, fast forward, uh, over the last few, several years, we, we have worked on uh, developing con model-based control approaches that can make connected and automated vehicles to coordinate in scenarios that there might be some conflict and, and avoid stop and go driving and, and, transport, and, and improve transportation efficiency. So let me take a, a few moments to deep dive into this problem and show you how we can technically uh, address this problem. I'm gonna to refer to an intersection just for the analysis, but uh, this uh, approach can be applied to any other traffic uh, scenario, roundabout, uh, merging roadway, uh, speed harmonization and so forth and so on. So let's consider that we have four connected automated vehicles that they're approaching an intersection. If they keep going, they will uh, eventually have some conflict at the center of the intersection. So the area at the center of the intersection that there might be a potential lateral collision is called merging zone. And then outside the merging zone, we define the control zone, which is the area inside of which the cars can communicate with each other, can exchange information and can coordinate. So the problem here is once the vehicles get inside the control zone to exchange information and coordinate so that they can cross the intersection without stop and go driving and without having any, any either rear end or safety, excuse me, or later lateral collision. So essentially, if we break down a little bit the problem, once the vehicle enters the, con the entry of the control zone, it has to uh, find out the times that will be entering the merging zone, uh, exiting the merging zone, and also exiting the control zone. Once the vehicle finds these times, then the next step is to, adapt, to derive the optimal acceleration or deceleration so that they can meet these times and cross the intersection without stop and go driving. So if you think about it, essentially we have two problems to address. The first is the upper level problem where we eventually uh, find the optimal times that the vehicle will be entering and exiting the control, the merging zone and the control zone, right? And then once we fix these times, the, the second problem is the low level energy minimization problem. We want to minimize the uh, optimal control input acceleration, deceleration of the vehicle for, with respect to these times. Now, what I plan to do in the next few minutes is to show how we can use the analytical solution of the low level control problem and, and formulate a new problem, the solution of which can address both problems. And why we want to do that? Well, as you will see in a while, the low level problem can become very tedious computationally and to the point that we can't really solve this in real time on board the vehicle. So we need to come up with a different approach that can give us the same solution, but can also be able to uh, you know, be derived on, on board the vehicle. So we, in our approach, we model every vehicle as a double integrator, where P is the position of the vehicle starting from the entry of the control zone, V is the speed of the vehicle, and U is the control input, acceleration, deceleration. Uh, we also have the SI, which is the distance of vehicle I from the preceding vehicle K, right? And we, um, you know, um, uh, this is the, this capture essentially the proximity sensor of the vehicle, let's say, this, this state. Now, somebody might argue here that, hey, you know what? That seems to be a very simple model to do controls, right? Um, you know, and, and, and be able to capture the complex vehicle dynamics. And that would be a, a fair argument. Now, 
what I plan to do is I'm going to use the double integrator model to develop an optimal trajectory of the control input. And then I will use a low level controller like a PI or PID controller to track this optimal trajectory, right? So essentially I convert the optimal control problem to a, a tracking uh, error, a tracking signal problem. And this is typical approach uh, that the OEMs follow to design the cruise controllers that we have. Now, this is also an argument that I will make later on about the discrepancy between model-based control approaches, right? So this, keep this in mind. Uh, the next step is to uh, define the um, uh, uh, control and state bounds as designated by the physical constraints of the system. So every vehicle has a maximum acceleration, deceleration capability. We need to capture this in our modeling framework. And for the time TI not that the vehicle enters the control zone until the time TIF that the vehicle exits the control zone, we pose some speed limits within the control zone. Uh, then we need to make sure that uh, the vehicle, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintain some uh, safe distance in between. So for each vehicle I, we um, require that the preceding, the preceding vehicle from a vehicle K needs to be greater than or equal to some safe distance delta I where delta i is a function of the speed of the vehicle because the higher the speed that we drive, the higher the distance that we need to maintain from the preceding vehicle, right? And then we also make sure that we have no lateral collision at the, at the merging zone, at the center of the, of, of the intersection. Once we get this done, then the, first, uh, the next thing is to uh, formulate our problem, which is minimizing the L2 norm of the control input from the time T and F that the vehicle enters the control zone until the time TIF that the vehicle exits the control zone, subject to my initial and final conditions, subject to my dynamics and all my state control and safety constraints. Now, somebody again might argue here that and say that, hey, you know what? You told us that you're going to minimize the energy consumption, the fuel consumption, but now minimizing the L2 norm of the control input. How these two are related? Well, if you remember from the first part of the talk, if you minimize transient engine operation, you get fuel economy benefits. So essentially, this is what we plan to do here, to minimize transit engine operation and give the driver the desired speed with a minimum acceleration deceleration capability. So we're trying to mimic steady state operation. And this is how the fuel consumption benefits will come from. Uh, now, to solve this problem, we formulate the Hamiltonian analysis, uh, Hamiltonian function following Hamiltonian analysis. And then if none of the state control or safety constraints becomes active, then we have a very nice closed form analytical solution where the optimal control input is an affine polynomial function with respect to time. The optimal speed of the vehicle is a nice quadratic polynomial of time. And the optimal position of the vehicle within the control zone is a nice cubic polynomial with respect to time where A, C, D, and E are some constants of integration that we can compute easily by the initial and final conditions of the system. However, if any of the state control or safety constraints become active, then things are getting complicated. So let me give you a flavor of what's the, this complication. Uh, first of all, the, in the unconstrained case, when none of the control state or, or safety constraints becomes active, from the TI not until the TIF, we have the very nice closed form analytical solution that we can solve on board the vehicle. However, if any of the state control or uh, uh, safety constraints becomes active, then we need to piece the constraints and unconstraints arcs together to satisfy the Euler-Lagrange Euler equations along with the uh, uh, interior conditions. And then this will result in a, in a set of uh, uh, nonlinear algebraic equations that we cannot really solve. Um, we cannot really have a, a close form solution. We seek a numerical solution with the steepest descent and other approaches, which means that we cannot really solve this problem on board the vehicle. Uh, and, and even if we get a solution, what might happen is that this new solution might activate another constraint in the path. So in this case, what we need to do is to repeat this process and again, piece all the constraint and unconstrained stuff together and so forth and so on. So as you can imagine, this can become really, really computationally intensive. Uh, just to give you another piece of, uh, you know, just another flavor of this comp uh, of complexity, if you consider the rear end safety constraint, if this real safety constraint becomes active, this will impose some uh, discontinuities of the influence function and Hamiltonian function. And to address these uh, discontinuities, we need to adjoin the partial derivative of the uh, uh, real safety constraint with respect to the state and by a set of Lagrange multiplier. 
and and and, and come up with a, a, a you know a set of uh, non-linear algebraic equations that we can solve in real time. So you can see the how much complex this can be. Now, to address this complexity, here's the, the new approach that we're taking. We start with a solution of the unconstrained case. This is the polynomial function, the cubic polynomial function of corresponding to the position of the bit. This is the, the, the result of the closed form solution that I showed you before. Now, this gives you the position of the vehicle from the entry of the control zone until the exit of the control zone. And if we observe this polynomial, we, we can make three observations. First, this is a real, uh, real value function. Second, this is differentiable. And third, it, this is strictly increasing, which implies that this is a one-to-one -one function, which implies that we, the, the inverse of this function exists. As a matter of fact, we can use the Gardano's method and, and inverse this function. And the inverse function looks like this. And we call this time trajectory of the vehicle. Now with the time trajectory, as you can see, we can see the time of the vehicle at its different uh, distance within the control zone all the way until the exit of the control zone. So if we take this new function and evaluate it at the exit of the control zone, right? This will give us the time that the vehicle will be exiting the control zone. And if we play around with a phi, then we can change the, the shape of this time trajectory. Now let's assume that we have all the time trajectories of all the vehicles inside the control zone. And, and, and this will correspond with a black line. Let's say now, for example, that there are some vehicles crossing the intersection, that would be the time trajectories of these vehicles. And we have all, some old, also vehicles going on the same lane or, or, or different lane, but on the same direction with our vehicle, right? That's these two black lines. Now, if we have these black lines, the time trajectories of the existing vehicles available, the, the vehicle that enters the control zone, what it has to do is to, to draw this time trajectory that doesn't intersect with any of the existing trajectories inside the control zone, and then find out the trajectory that minimizes the timing that will be exiting the control zone. So with this, this implies that we don't activate any of the state control or safety constraints inside of the vehicle which means that if we inverse back, we get the analytical solution of the low level problem without activating any of the constraint constraints. And, and with this approach, conceptually, we can solve both problems in real time. So we, the, first up, the first step is to, to drive, to derive the time trajectory without intersecting any of the exi ex existing uh, trajectories, which means that we do not activate any of the safety constraints and then inverse back and we have the solution of the low level problem. So just to give you, this is the conceptual approach, just to give you uh, this uh, discussion in, 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 a, in a math context, essentially what we do, first of all, we, we start with a cubic polynomial, we use Cardano's method and we get the uh, time trajectory TPI and we evaluate this, tip, this time trajectory at the exit of the control zone. So now we have a new function F, with respect to phi's, phi's are the coefficient. And if I play around with the phi's, I change the shape of this time trajectory. So this is going to be my uh, objective function. I want to minimize F phi with respect to phi's. Now, before I formulate my optimization problem, I need to make sure that I satisfy all the interior conditions. So essentially, I need to make sure that the position of the vehicle at the entry and exit of the control zone are satisfied. I satisfy my initial and, and final conditions. Uh, the speed at the entry of the control zone is satisfied, uh, the influence function at the edge of the control zone and the position of, uh, of the vehicle at the entry of the merging zone. So that those are my equality constraints. At the same time, I want to make sure that uh, the solution when I derive my time trajectory doesn't bio violate my maximum mean speed limits, the maximum and minimum control inputs. And at the same time, I satisfy all my safety constraints. So if I get a solution like this, that satisfy all these constraints, it means that I have a time trajectory that doesn't intersect, that, is, that doesn't activate any of my safety control constraints or uh, state and control uh, bounds, which means that I can inverse back and get my analytical solution. So to formulate this problem, essentially we minimize the time trajectory evaluated at the exit of the control zone, subject to my equality and, uh, and uh, inequality constraints. Uh, just to, um, incorporate, make the vehicle uh, available to change lanes. I, I you know, I, uh, you know, incorporate the occupancy set of all the lanes available in, in the direction of the vehicle uh, so that the vehicle can find out 
which lane is appropriate to um, you know, squeeze by and, and get through the intersection. Now, the question now is, can we solve this problem in real time? Well, it turns out that the uh, cost function um, along is, a, is, a, is a convex function and the quality and quality constraints are all uh, affine convex functions, which means that if I apply the weaker Slater's condition, um, uh, we can show that there's no duality gap within the optimization problem. And this implies that I can solve this problem in real time. Uh, this framework uh, and the variations of this framework can be applied, has been applied in, in different uh, uh, cases uh, with multiple scenarios, multiple intersections in speed reduction zones. So let me show you some examples. Uh, this is the intersection in our scale city, and you can see how the vehicles get into the control zone and derive the optimal time trajectories to cross the intersection without stop and go driving. Um, we also consider uh, a corridor in our scale city that included an one intersection, one merging uh, roadway, and one roundabout. You can see how all the vehicles uh, navigating through this corridor and uh, coordinate without stop and go driving and without any uh, activating any of the safety constraints. Uh, we also uh, um, implement this in our uh, demo vehicle. That was an RPI project, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, in collaboration with Bosch. That was our industrial partner, Boston University, University of Michigan, and Oak Ridge National Lab. The uh, goal of this project was to develop control technologies that can maximize the efficiency of this Audi by at least twenty uh, percent. And the idea was to use connectivity and automation to improve the powertrain of the system, as I showed you earlier on. And at the same time, optimize the speed profile of the vehicle by coordinating the vehicle with other vehicles. So let me show you some examples. Uh, we use the test bed in M City at the University of Michigan. This is a big area that they use to test autonomous vehicles. Uh, as you can see now uh, on, on, the, on the video, the Audi is alone on the field test. However, the Audi interacts with a bunch of uh, virtual vehicles, which are the black vehicles that you can see on the left. On the top is the baseline scenario without connectivity and automation. On the bottom is the uh, scenario when all the vehicles are connected and automated and can coordinate with each other. So as you can see now, the Audi on the bottom coordinates with the other uh, you know, virtual vehicles, the black vehicles, and can get into the control in the merging zone without stop and go driving, as you can see here. On the top, there is a virtual vehicle ahead of the Audi. So the Audi you know, needs to come to a full stop and wait until all these vehicles create a gap for this vehicle to uh, squeeze in. So you can see the impact of travel time and the stop, stop and go driving without connectivity and automation. Now the Audi was able to get in. Uh, this is another example in the roundabout, same, same scenario on the top is the baseline scenario on the, on the bottom is the coordinated scenario. You can see how there is a gap since the vehicles can coordinate so that the Audi squeeze in and, and, and pass the, the, the roundabout. On the top, the Audi still waits uh, for the roundabout to, to get in. Um, we also uh, consider a, a big uh, corridor in, uh, in the M-City. So you can see the Audi getting into the M-City and going through different scenarios. This is, the video is in a fast uh, mode uh, and, and goes through the men's roadway. This green line was a speed harmonization. We have an artificial uh, stop and go, uh, you know, uh, driving that the vehicle is supposed to coordinate. Uh, so we have also a roundabout, we have uh, you know, an intersection. So the Audi went through all these scenarios and eventually uh, were able to uh, classify the different fuel consumptions that I'm going to show you in a, in a little while. Uh, this is a, a vehicle in the loop that we did at Bosch facilities in uh, Farmington Hills in Michigan. Uh, on the left is the baseline scenario without stop and go driving. On the right is the coordinate scenario. And you can see how by optimize coordinating the Audi with other vehicles, how we can eliminate the stop and go driving. This is the speed profile of the vehicle, of the Audi, and this is after coordination. So essentially we translate the stop and go, the, the city driving to a highway driving. Um, so this is the Audi getting into the uh, entry of the uh, M-City. The Audi is now in a chassis dyno and interacting virtually with all the other vehicles inside the uh, merging, uh, within the simulation environment. This is the typical vehicle in the loop scenario. 
Uh, this is one of the speed profiles that we developed. Uh, the red line is corresponds to the Audi with connectivity and auto automation. And the blue line is, again, the speed profile of the Audi without connectivity automation. And you can see the elimination of a stop and go driving. We did these experiments under different traffic volumes and under different uh, initial conditions. So that's why we have different speed profiles so that we can see a spectrum of that uh, approach. So particularly in this, in this scenario, we can see uh, elimination of more stop and go driving uh, cases. And uh, that's the third speed profile. Again, we had more stop and go driving in this case and which has been eliminated. And, and, and then you can see some of the uh, fuel economy results uh, of the Audi at the different initial uh, state of charge of the Audi. So the, the fuel economy benefits ranges from 30% all the way to 34%. Uh, and this is a summary of all the tests that we did in uh, MCT with the Audi. Uh, those are improvements on travel time for each individual uh, scenario and for the entire corridor. Uh, of course, as you can imagine, these benefits are not adding up. Uh, you have different benefits on individual scenario, but then if you consider the, the entire corridor, uh, you get some sort of 70% improvement on travel time. And this is on, mile, uh, on miles per gallon uh, fuel economy. Um, so you can see the individual improvements for the on-wrap scenario, speed harmonization, roundabout, and for the entire uh, corridor, which are quite remarkable, right? In the sense that we, you can, you know, if you can consider that we have a utopian scenario where all the vehicles are connected automated, uh, we, we can have a significant benefits both in travel time and also uh, fuel economy. So, so far I show you uh, several, uh, you know, model-based uh, and learning uh, approaches. And we've seen that with a model-based control approaches, we cannot always facilitate optimal solutions due to the discrepancy between the model, the model and the actual system. Uh, if you remember with a connected automated vehicle, I, due to the discrepancy between the double integrator and the real vehicle, I use a PI controller to track the optimal trajectory, right? Uh, with a supervised learning uh, approaches, we cannot always facilitate robust solutions by using offline data. If you remember with a fuel injector curve, I, although I use supervised learning from data that I have, I also had to use real-time adaptive control so that I can account for uh, robustness. Now, on, on the contrary, when you use reinforcement learning techniques, you can really apply these techniques directly on your system because this can have implications on safety and robustness. For example, when I did the uh, self-learning control on the engine, it was hard for me to apply this directly to the engine in the sense that the feasible action space changes over time, changes due to the environmental conditions. So even if you um, identify, let's say precisely, that this is the feasible uh, injection time that I can take when the torque and, and the engine, uh, the torque uh, and the engine has, has, has a specific value, this will change due to the environmental conditions, due to the you know, geographic conditions, so it's really hard to apply uh, reinforcement learning techniques directly on, the, on your system. So the, uh, the idea is how we can combine both. And before we will be able to combine learning and control and address these challenges, the, the question is how we can separate this. So for the last 10 minutes of the talk, I plan to show you a framework, how we can potentially separate uh, you know, uh, learning from control and eventually be able to, to, to combine both. So let's consider that we have an actual cyber physical system and there's some disturbance of this system. And also we have some noise observation of this system, right? So uh, at the same time, we have some model, a model, any model of this system, and we operate it in parallel with, my, with our actual, actual system. The idea here is to establish an information state and use this information state of the system, which by the way, this information state will include some some information from the actual CPS and the CPS model, and use this information state to derive offline the control strategy of the system using the model. Now, since I'm deriving the control strategy offline, right, I, I am missing some information um, uh, from the actual CPS. Now, once I derive this control strategy offline, then I apply it to my system, and as I'm starting getting data from the system, then I'm learning the information state. And, and then I will show you that once you learn the information state, the optimal control strategy that you derive offline becomes optimal also for the actual uh, CPS. So let me get you uh, to some more details of, of this approach. 
Let's consider that we have a cyber physical system consisting of different subsystems with, inform with this centralized information structure. Let's say that this is the uh, group of uh, connected automated vehicles that are about to cross the intersection, right? Now, XT is the system, the state of my system, XT hat. Uh, WT, WT is the disturbance of the system, and UT is, UTK is the control input of each of my subsystems. Let's say that uh, UTK is the acceleration, deceleration of each of my subsystems. XT hat is the state of my system consisting of the position of the vehicles and the speed of the vehicles. And WD is the disturbance of, of, of my system. Now, uh, XT hat and WD are some uh, random variables defined on the appropriate probability space. Now, for each of, uh, of my uh, subsystem, I, uh, I have some noise observation. Let's say, for example, that each of my CAV can observe the state of the entire system with some sort of noise. They might have some idea about the state of the other system, other vehicles, but with some noise because there's some noise from the, uh, you know, signal from the from the proximity sensor or from the communication of the vehicles. Now, the problem here is to to. Uh, come up with the optimal strategy of the system that can minimize the expected total cost, right? Where CT are some measurable cost functions of my actual CPS. Let's say that the control strategy here is to define the optimal acceleration deceleration of each of the individual uh, CAVs that can cross the intersection, just to give you the parallel notion. Now, to, to solve this problem, we can only really solve this problem simply because we don't have, we don't know the dynamics of the actual system. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put the CPS model, the CPS model is the double integrator models that we have in parallel with the actual CPS. And we establish the information state of the system, which is the joint conditional probability distribution of the state of my model and the state of my actual CPS, given all the data that I have from the model. Now, what is all this data? This data, if you remember, consists of the pair delta T and lambda T. Since we have a decentralized information system, right? We consider that there's an end step delay between the subsystems. For example, every observation and control action of a particular a subsystem becomes known after n step time steps to the other system. Now, if you consider, for example, the uh, connected automated vehicles and information from every vehicle will reach another vehicle after n step, n uh, n step, time steps just because there's some delay between the information. So delta T corresponds all the observations and the control input of the, each of the subsystems up to time T minus N. So this is the common information that all the vehicles share, right? And LTK is the information, the observation and the control inputs, which are private to each individual vehicle, right? This is not, it's, it's, it's a private information. So delta T, the per delta T and lambda T is, essentially the information structure of the system. Now, using this information state, I'm gonna uh, use the model that I have and derive the optimal control strategy of the system offline. However, XT hat is unknown, right? This is XT hat is the, the state of my actual CPS, which I do not know because I derive this optimal strategy offline, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna parameterize the optimal control strategy, strategy with respect to the uh, different realizations of the state of my actual CPS. And then once I derive the optimal control strategy, I will apply it to my actual CPS and CPS. So I'm gonna operate both systems at the same time using the control strategy I derived offline. And as I collect data, right, I'm gonna start learning the, the, the state, the information state of my system. So when this information state becomes known, then the optimal control strategy of the system that I, de I derived offline using the model, will become opt optimal for the actual CPS. However, in order for me to do this exercise, I need to separate the control and the learning. So I need to make sure that the evolution of the information state does not, be, does not depend on the control strategy of the system. As a matter of fact, the first result uh, shows this. So we can show that the information state does not depend on the control strategy. So when, when the, the evolution of the information state does not depend on the control strategy, and, and we can show that there is a function phi t, analytical, analytical function, that give us the evolution of this information state. So this is the critical step. Once we establish this, uh, then we can proceed. And, and then 
Um, just to remind you, that was the, the original problem that we want to solve for the actual CPS. We want to address to derive an optimal control strategy that minimizes the expected total cost function of the actual CPS. However, instead of solving this uh, you know, uh, problem, we're going to solve this um, uh, you know, optimal control problem, which essentially, using the uh, CPS model, which essentially impose a, a penalty function between any discrepancy of the realization of the state of my model and the state of my system. Now, if I derive the optimal control strategy using the CPS model offline of this control, of this cost function, then the optimal control strategy becomes optimal for the problem one. Um, so the, 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 the second result that we have is that the optimal control strategy derived from problem two is optimal for the problem one. Just to give you the intuition of this approach, when we derive this optimal control strategy offline, essentially for every realization of the state of my model, right, I derive an optimal control input. However, since I do not know the state of my actual CPS, essentially I derive my optimal control input for every different realization of my actual state of the uh, the actual state of my um, uh, the state of my actual CPS, right? So I have essentially a vector instead of having a single value. And then once I derive this optimal control strategy and apply it to my real system, as I start learning the control uh, the information state, I select control inputs that yields a state of the information uh, of the actual uh, CPS, which minimizes this cost, the discrepancy between the uh, state of my CPS model and the actual CPS. And eventually this converges, the more I learn and becomes uh, uh, you know, accurate my information state, this discrepancy becomes tends to zero and eventually the optimal control strategy that I derive offline uh, you know, becomes optimal for the actual CPS. So this is briefly just to give you a flavor of, of this approach. As we, um, you know, um, ongoing work includes applying this approach to the uh, problem that I discussed earlier on, on connection automated vehicles. So essentially, if you remember, in this problem, we were minimizing the end to norm of the control input, right? And we end up with a nice close form analytical solution. Now, instead of solving a problem, uh, uh, you know, minimizing the L2 norm of the control input, I revise, reformulate the problem and incorporate the discrepancy between the actual CPS state and the CPS model state. And, and when we derive this uh, offline, we start learning the information state and eventually uh, we want to show that uh, this uh, you know, um, control strategy becomes uh, uh, optimal for the actual uh, CPS. Eventually this approach um, can be useful to um, you know, system, CPS systems when eventually we have a large volume of data that is added to the system gradually and not altogether in advance. So we can really, um, you know, uh, apply directly in this case uh, reinforcement learning, supervised learning, or, or model-based control approaches. Those uh, applications can include the merging mobility system, uh, power systems, information uh, uh, cooperation of robots, um, um, Internet of Things, and, and other uh, applications. So with this um, um, talk, I, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for the insight into your work and into your recent, recent work also on uh, the learning-based strategies. And, uh, yeah, I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience in the room or online. Uh, yeah, maybe a very general question at, at the beginning. Uh, people ask me also. <laughs> Uh, you showed two videos of uh, autonomy from the uh, last century, from uh, General Motors also from, I, as I remember, 56. And you are also working on, on this topic. Um, if I would ask you, what do you think when we are going to have full autonomy? Uh, do, do you think <laughs> we are going to have it in our lifetime? Well, uh, yeah, that's that's a great question, and uh, many people wonder uh, how um, how things will look like. Uh, well, I, I think we we would be able in our lifetime, at least uh, at least uh, for us, um, 
to, to see some of that in specific uh, control environments like a university campus or a corporation campus. I don't really think, or, or perhaps in utility vehicles or, or in buses in specific, or in airports, in areas that we can have a full control. I don't really see that we, things are really mature enough at, at the moment that we can see in, in downtown Stuttgart or in downtown New York City, you see some sort of autonomous vehicles mixed up with human driven vehicles. Once you put the human in the loop, um, things become, uh, you know, kind of uh, challenging. Uh, you know, uh, for example, speaking from my perspective, I, 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 it's very hard for me to believe that, uh, you know, I can see autonomous cars mixed up with the Greek drivers downtown Athens. I mean, this is out, you know, uh, it's kind of off or, or in, in Napoli. Um, however, as I said, in, you know, as things become uh, mature, technologically speaking, then I can definitely see uh, autonomous vehicles mixed up uh, nicely with human driven vehicles, but in specific scenarios, perhaps having human drivers being treated or, or trained uh, to, to interact with this. And eventually this is going to be a learning curve. It took us a while to, for all of us to, you know, uh, wear a safe belt. Um, it took us a while to adjust with a, uh, you know, uh, ABS braking. So it, it's a learning curve that eventually will get there. Yeah, uh, thank you for the answer. I uh, think also we uh, we need also driving license for autonomous cars just to accept <laughs> to accept them. Uh, maybe you can look for. Uh, questions from the audience, Patrick. Um, also, here from the room, you can raise your hand if you have a question. I have a question. So, yes, according, to, uh, according to my understanding, so we do the control strategy offline and we do the learning uh, part online. But uh, 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 like I have done some uh, simple project about supervised learning or some uh, reinforcement learning. At that, at that moment, uh, every time when I want to do this the learning process, like the training process, it always takes a lot of time. So uh, how do you fix this problem? I mean, uh, when we do this uh, training process, I think uh, this should be finally a real-time applicable. So how is actually this problem solved? Or did I understand this wrong? No, no, great question. Absolutely, you understood it very nicely. Uh, great question. So, uh, this is this. You are absolutely correct. How much time it takes for something to be learned and, and converts? It's a very critical question. Now, if you here is the let, let me break down this problem a little bit. Um, so, essentially, what as you can see, what what we need to do here is to learn a conditional probability distribution, right? Now, if you think about it, if we take a step back in, in this particular problem, what we did, we solved this problem offline using the CPS model, right? If you forget anything about what I said, this is what we do today. We have a, an actual system, we have an, a model, we take the model, we derive an optimal control strategy offline, and then we apply this optimal control strategy to, to the actual system. And then we see that, of course, there's some discrepancy because this is, you know, there's the discrepancy between the model and the actual system. Now, the only difference here is that the control strategy that I derive is parameterized with respect to the realization of, of, the, of the state of my actual CPS. So the whole problem now is, is, is uh, tend to just to learn this state probability, conditional probability distribution. The good thing that I haven't uh, shown this into in the presentation, I can break down this probability distribution to some simpler form. So eventually this becomes very, you know, the problem reduces to, to learn two simple conditional probability distributions. And, and, and this can be given the data that you have from the model. This turns out to be relatively easy to converge, to learn. So it doesn't take a lot of time. However, this is ongoing work. Um, I, I, I don't have uh, data or, or any concrete outcome that can, I can tell with some sort of certainty, but the intuition at this, mo at this moment says that we might not be, it might not be challenging to, to learn the, this conditional probability distribution in a short period of time. And of course, this depends on the application, depends on how big is the state space and how big is the control space. 
you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, th there are a lot of questions that we, we still need to address. But at this point, at least from the theoretical perspective, this is a very early, um, you know, uh, uh, outcome. Uh, we think that it might not be so much challenging to learn this information state. Because if you think about it, when we do supervised learning or reinforcement learning, essentially we, we span all the action space with a, with a state space. We, we're trying to find out all these different combinations. Now, what we need to do is just to learn a conditional probability distribution, which at least in theory, it seems to be uh, uh, not so much challenging. But again, it, it, it remains to, to show this when we start applying this approach in applications. I'm not sure if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. And also, uh, uh, so if, uh, in this training process, when we finally uh, app applicate this, uh, this training process, so is there uh, uh, also some kind of warm start for this training process, just like uh, we did in MPC? Well, that's a great question too. Uh, thank you for asking this. No, we don't require to have any initial guess. We can start from absolutely zero. However, as I said, if you break down this um, uh, probability distribution, it turns out to be a function of some probab conditional probability distributions of the model, which you know this already, and some probability distributions that involve the actual uh, CPA state. So it turns out that eventually you, you don't start from zero, you start from some sort of known value of this information state. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for your question. Uh, and I guess we can look for further questions. Maybe you can see if we have in uh, in the chat. Uh, you can raise your hand. Yeah, we have a question on uh, from Fabian Ohm. So please, Fabian. Uh, yeah. So it's a rather rather simple question. I think it was on slide 38, 39. Maybe you can go there. It was about the the results from the. Um, New control. This is ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was just curious. So um, you showed uh, that there were improvements with the fuel con consumption and the traveling time. Were they different scenarios, or were that in 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 one go we reached both improvements, or were there different like different cost functions or something like that? Yeah, great question. Uh, so for, for, for the examples that you see now is like, we did different, uh, you know, um, we, we, we focus on, on the on-ramp for individual scenario, right? And then let me back up. We did the whole corridor, but then we, we, we show the benefits, the travel time benefits for the entire corridor and the fuel consumption benefits for the entire corridor. And then we got the same results, the same corridor, but we focus on, on each individual scenario. And we try to find out the initial and final conditions and, and do the computation and see what's, what's the benefit in between individually. I'm not sure if this is what you are asking. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I think we mean different things. Um, oh. Give me a second. Take your time. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, this slide compared to the one before, I think that was it. So, oh, okay. I see. Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, I, see. I mean, uh, I see. You what showed, you're saying, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, travel time and fuel consumption, not uh, the different parts of the of the of the route. That's not what I meant. Let me see. You're asking for this uh, table, maybe. So eventually, let, let me try to, to give a shot. Um, you have two different, two, two different benefits. When, when we look at the fuel consumption benefits, these benefits come from two different sources. One source is by minimizing the stop and go driving, optimizing the speed profile. And there's also a benefit coming from optimizing the pattern of the system because we did that at the same time. Now, travel time means that, you know, you measure how much time it takes for the vehicle to from the entry of the control zone until the exit of the from the entry of the corridor until the exit of the corridor with a baseline scenario and then you measure again the travel time the same travel time when you have connectivity automation and you see the improvement and we also have this improvement comes from the entry and exit of the control zone for on ramp speed harmonization and roundabout 
and this is for the entry and exit of the corridor. For the fuel consumption, we did the same thing, but now we, we computed the equivalent miles per gallon because this is a hybrid electric vehicle, so we need to account for the state of charge variations of the battery. Okay, I'm so I'm yeah. answering the question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think the question was much much simpler. So just the point was about I think in the end you indirectly already answered it. So those measurements were from the same scenario, and they were not like well, at first we try only to reduce the travel time, and the other time we only oh, try to reduce the uh, oh, the oh, fuel consumption. Yeah. That was the question. It was oh yes, 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 both absolutely. independent from each, each other. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the confusion. Yes, you are absolutely right. We did one experiment and we, we oh, and, and let me back up. Yes, we did one experiment and we measured travel time and fuel consumption. However, the objective was to improve fuel consumption, not travel time. Travel time just came by. It was not our intention to improve travel time. The intention for us was to improve fuel consumption because we're minimizing the L2 norm of the control input. However, if you avoid stop and go driving, we get benefits in travel time as well. But in our objective, when we formulate the problem was we didn't include travel time. It, it just a, a very nice welcome result. Okay, thank you very much. Now I got it. Yeah, before taking the next question from Matteo, I would like to uh, push a question from my side uh, because it's related to the energy uh, consumption. Uh, Andreas, you showed in your uh, PhD work that you can minimize the energy combustion, the energy consumption for combustion engines if you minimize the transition between operating points. Mm -hmm. And you showed that you minimize the transition between operating points in uh, CAVs if you would minimize the acceleration. Right? Yeah. Okay, and my question is, uh, you showed also your works on hybrid and electrical vehicles. Uh, does it apply also for hybrid and electrical vehicles, this assumption that minimizing the transition between uh, operating points also minimizes the energy? This is a great question. A great question. Uh, uh, thank you for asking. You're absolutely correct. There is no uh, direct analogy between conventional vehicles that you have engines and uh, electric vehicles. Actually, in electric vehicles, when you have stop and go driving uh, for the stop driving, I mean, when you brake, this is good news because you regenerate some of the brake uh, regeneration, so you, you recharge your battery. So there is no direct analogy. If you improve, um, of course, if you have hard accelerations on an electric vehicle, you, you discharge the battery significantly. But the approach of minimizing transient engine operation with minimizing transient motor operation in electric vehicles, it's not directly. Uh, I don't have results to back up this uh, claim. So the L2 norm of the control input would work well if you have an engine. If you have an electric vehicle, not necessarily. That's, that will not necessarily true. Yeah, this would be very interesting. Now we can move on to the question of uh, Matteo. Yes, thanks. So at first, thanks uh, for the presentation. And I would have uh, yeah, two short questions. So at first, regarding um, yeah, your, your robot cars in the lab, um, which kind of sensors do you use for them? Just the camera to, to navigate and determine the position or also like LiDAR or ultrasound? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. So essentially, we have the Vicon system. Let me let me show you one of the uh, videos. Perhaps I can. Uh, um, so we have a, a, a Vicon system, and then we can uh, observe. Uh, you know, uh, every uh, as you can see, the cars do have these uh, markers on top. You see these markers. And for these markers, we uh, essentially use the Vicon system on, 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 on uh, you know, above the, the lab, the test bed, and we can okay. measure position and the speed. And then some of the vehicles have also proximity sensors ahead, so we can measure the distance between uh, you know, preceding vehicles. Yes, sure, makes sense. And uh, as well, um, if we take a look at the like the current market, with uh, what kind of solutions uh, the OEMs are offering uh, regarding self-driving technology, 
Uh, who do you estimate or who, in your opinion, is delivering the best? Is it Tesla with their autopilot or is there something else which is more advanced? I don't, I don't know. What's, what's your opinion on this? Well, I, I think uh, all OEMs have made a lot of progress. Uh, I'll give you a, a very simple example. When I was working at GM in 2008, 2010, We've been working on these technologies, on, on how you can have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. And th there were a lot of good results, which still not available on the public because it takes some time for the R&D work to get through the commercialization path. But I think all the OEMs have made a lot of progress. Um, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to, you know, to rank which perhaps um, individual uh, OEM might be a little bit ahead of the others. Uh, as you know, there have been accidents and there have been, uh, you know, some unfortunate events, which means that we are not still 100% there. Uh, there are still some glitches. Parts of this, uh, you know, is due to the human error, uh, not necessarily on the automated uh, part. Uh, but I think um, all the OEMs now can offer some uh, vehicles with some nice safety features that you can maintain. For example, you can leave can have some semi-autonomous features that, you know, cruising on, on, on the same lane or getting alerts, uh, you know, um, if, if there, there might be an accident and things like that. Um, we're getting there. We still have way to go, though. Uh, it, it's, uh, and all will depend on the driving environment and, and the human driving conditions. It's, uh, it's you know, it, it might be more challenging if you put an autonomous car uh, on uh, on Times Square in New York City, or in uh, you know in another more uh, you know less dense uh, area, it, it's you know it all depends of, of 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 the driving conditions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yeah, and we can uh, take the question of Leo. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the uh, lecture. And uh, yeah, my question is. Um, uh, again, about the, the lab and the, the intersection route optimization or speed optimization. Um, do you have priorities on the cars or how do you like avoid that two cars optimize at the same point and then uh, at one point? Uh, yeah, crash? great question. Great question. Thank you for asking. Well, yes, uh, we don't have any priority. So the idea here is that once the car enters the control zone. First of all, we do that in a sequential matter. Let's say that there is no car inside the control zone, right? Zero. Um, once the vehicle enters the control zone, it derives its optimal acceleration from the entry of the control zone until the exit of the control zone, right? It might be, oops. Ah. So it might be, for example, um, let me just go to this slide from this entry until this exit. Now, once you derive the optimal acceleration deceleration, there is an intersection protocol and this vehicle will share this trajectory and record it to the intersection protocol. Now, the second vehicle gets into the control zone. It access the intersection protocol, see the time trajectory and derives its own time trajectory to not intersect with this trajectory and so forth and so on. Now, let's assume that two vehicles enters the control zone at the same time. So in this particular case, they need to flip a coin. It's, it's a random process, how, which one will derive its optimal trajectory first or second, it doesn't really matter. Now, some, some approaches, you know, let's say that we, you have a, an emergency vehicle that needs to prioritize. Um, there are two theories here. One theory says, just let the vehicles go the same sequence because it's just don't disturb this, this, uh, this case. Since you have maximized the efficiency of of the intersection, they will go through the intersection the easiest way. If you try to reprioritize the vehicle, you might get, you know, depending on the traffic volume, you might get the worst results. We haven't, uh, you know, we haven't tried to reprioritize the vehicles. It seems intuitively that the better way to approach is just let the vehicles go with uh, the same sequence. I'm not okay, sure if I thank answered you. your question. Yeah, yeah, you definitely did. So you just queue the the vehicles in the order they enter the control zone. Yeah, yeah. 
the second question is uh, have you like it's it's a bit off topic but have you thought of like other means than the actual inter like interconnection between the vehicles like just that they see each other do you see possibilities to reach similar results right uh that's a great question too uh well Given the work that we have done so far, it seems that we need to have some sort of communication with infrastructure. You know, relying only on the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, it seems to us that it's not enough. Uh, you know, if you take this approach, for example, although it's decentralized, you need to, in, in a sense, in the sense that every vehicle derives its optimal, makes its optimal decision on its own, we still need to have the intersection protocol, which doesn't do any controls but it acts as uh, a storage device that the vehicles can store information and other vehicles can access this information. So it seems to us that you need to have some sort of infrastructure or iCloud that there might be some vehicle to infrastructure communication. Relying only on the vehicle to vehicle communication might be very, uh, you know, it might be a stretch to get the same results. Although some um, uh, research efforts include only vehicle to vehicle communication. I have seen some papers in this area. Okay, cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Maybe also a question from my side relating to uh, the CEDs. Uh, you showed the merging scenario in your experiments where the uh, Bosch vehicle uh, enters the highway. And uh, my question is, Uh, it minimizes the traveling time for itself. And in a mixed traffic, it would be the greedy vehicle, the greedy driver, right? Yeah, um, exactly. You, you, you're absolutely correct here. We, we, for this merging scenario, we have done several studies uh, ranging from low traffic volume, medium traffic volume, and high traffic volume. And depending on the traffic for this particular scenario, we get mixed results. So at some point, um, and we, all, we have also do the same scenario when you start reducing the penetration rate from 100% CAVs all the way to 0% CAVs. Um, you know, depending how many lanes you have on ramp, how many lanes you have here, um, you, you might get mixed results. So th this is a little bit uh, complicated uh, scenario because this is asymmetric that, from that perspective. An intersection is fully symmetric. You have the same, almost the same traffic volumes or you know, the same conditions. In this particular case, you have the highway and then you have the ramp, right? So, you know, um, and, and depending on the lanes, the number of lanes, you, you might get different results. So I don't have an, a clear answer for you uh, uh, <laughs> for this particular problem. <laughs> I could imagine that uh, an autonomous car could uh, not be greedy, could also give the right of way where it would have the right of way to improve the, uh, the throughput in the, in the in traffic, right? You are absolutely correct, yes. And actually we do some of that, some of that, um, we start doing this, let me show if I have the slide. Yeah, in this case, we start doing, uh, you know, using the CAVs to create platoons of vehicles of, CA, of human driven vehicles, and then make the CAVs acting as, as uh, referees, you know, just to, to, to adjust the traffic so that you can smooth out. Uh, you know, so let's say that you have a, a, an, acceler an aggressive human driver, If you have a CAV that can control this aggressive driving behavior, then you can control the traffic conditions. And then, of course, you can, you can claim that, hey, you know, the aggressive driver will change lane. Well, if he changes lane, then he will bump up to another CAV that will do the same thing. And then the question becomes, how, what's the minimum number of CAVs that you need to have to the network so that you can uh, sort of, uh, you know, referee the traffic conditions? Yeah. That's very, very interesting. <laughs> so we can combine our ideas to to <laughs> <laughs> So I'm looking to the audience in the room. Do you have further questions? 
Um, on Zoom, I give you some seconds to think about your questions. I have maybe one question. Um, okay, from now on. Yeah. So uh, you showed um, plug in hybrid uh, vehicles. Um, and I was wondering is the most, or you, you showed that you can charge the battery with your motor. And I was wondering is like the, the most benefit you get from it this that you can keep your motor at these. Uh, static operating points, or and then you can re re reduce the transient motion by yeah, charging the battery if you don't need the torque. Or absolutely, this is a great question. So it depends on the hybrid. If you have a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and you want to, let's say, you, first of all, as a driver, you have the options either to have a sustaining mode of the of the of the vehicle, or you can go from uh, fully charged all the way to low charge. Um, let's say you drive in a highway and you know that you're going to get to the city driving in a while. So you want to make to maintain high SOC on the highway driving and, and use all the battery when you get to the driving, uh, you know, to the city driving so that you can use pure electric uh, mode on the driving. Now, um, for this particular problem, in our case, we consider a hybrid electric vehicle, uh, which is, it's, it's not a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So, so the idea is how you can, you know, given the driving conditions, any driving conditions, might be city or highway driving, how you can operate the whole system, system under the Pareto optimal solution, you know, get this equilibrium operating point. Um, but, you know, if we now consider that you have connected automated vehicles, and you can you know a priori all your driving uh, route and you know that at some point in the future it will get to the city and might be congestion because you have this information so you can change the strategy and instead of optimizing the average cost that i did in this particular case optimize, optimize the total cost from point a to point b because you have all this information right so you say okay i'm gonna just use don't use the battery now use my engine and then save my uh, state of charge of the battery and later on, when I get to the to the you know uh, to the city, and since you know the entire traffic, because now this is a connected automated vehicle, you can compute the vehicle can compute if the state of charge will be enough until your final destination. And then, if this is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, you can uh, you know automate the whole process and say, okay, I'm gonna be at my des destination at that time with this state of charge, so I can plug in the vehicle and, and, and fully charge it at uh, my final destination. So the question, the answer is that using connectivity, you can make even better results than the one that I show you here in, in this particular case. Just to remind you that that was for the average cost criterion. It was not for the total cost criterion. So I, I'm optimizing on average, but the average in a vehicle, we can get better results if you consider the total cost criterion from point A to point B. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So I'm looking again into the room or into Zoom, and it's already uh, 4 p.m. here in, in Germany, and it's <laughs> 10 o'clock in the morning in uh, uh, where, where you are this time, right? And we, we were very, very, very happy uh, having you today with, with us uh, as you uh, as you see, we have a lot of questions and we are very interested in your works. And uh, after this uh, presentation, I got more excited to read more about your work. I already read some of your works and I'm now very interested in uh, maybe reading of the recent work uh, of the, uh, yeah, the learning, the separation of learning and control. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, it was a great pleasure to to virtually visit uh, your lab and uh, your university. Uh, any student, if if you guys have any questions, please uh, send me an email. Uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. And I hope that uh, at some point I can visit uh, Aachen and, uh, and and Germany overall. 
and enjoy a nice neutral with a beer. I am a big fan of both. <laughs> uh, I know that there is the Intelligent Vehicle Symposium in Germany in June. So we plan to submit a couple of papers and see if we can, uh, any of uh, my students or myself uh, come in June, depending on the how COVID uh, will play out. <laughs> I would be very happy. You are very welcome. Very, very welcome. Okay, and with this, I would uh, close uh, the lecture. And yeah, thank you again. And thank the participants. And yeah, I will uh, get to you via email for uh, some discussions. So thank you. And yeah, have a nice day. Absolutely. Bye, guys. <laughs>